And right. that is called a segue. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so let's talk about the uh, alright. We, we'll we, we got we got more time here. We actually were Wait, little, you want to swap sides? We're a little bit slow. We only got fifteen. We minutes. started a little late. Alright. Follow so, the timer on that. Okay, cool. Uh, so the ethics of mind control, right? So I am not an ethicist, right? I type the thing. <laughs> Whatever. You know, I took one ethics class in college. It's actually pretty cool. I learned a lot, but I did not have a degree in that. No I took I... ethics as well, but we mostly studied the effect of uh, jet skis and things like that. We I learned about the, the Challenger disaster and stuff oh, like that, right? But okay. yeah, we don't know shit about this. Um, <laughs> so we really don't have any answers for you about ethics, right? I'm not going to tell you what e what's ethical and what's not because I really don't know. And I'm not going to pretend to know, because then someone who does know is going to ream me, right? Unlike the last panel, where we can pretend to know about games and then maybe argue with someone here. We got nothing. Going to admit we got nothing. That's a lesson you should learn. Uh, so all we have is questions, right? And the thing is, some things have been bothering me. You know, more people. <laughs> Inside joke. After the panel ends, we're going to tell you something crazy. Okay. So. Hold on. Right. Uh, so these questions, I've been having these ethical questions lately about a lot of games, you know, especially free-to-play games, the hottest topic in the universe. Now many of you might have been thinking about these things. For example, have you ever thought maybe some of these games are a little too addictive? Yeah. Maybe I'm a little too addicted to a game? I don't know if they are or aren't. I'm not going to argue whether they are or aren't. I just have these questions and I want people to start asking these questions more because it seems like most of the industry just doesn't even care. They just do it. All right, so mind control. This is a card from Steve Jackson game Illuminati, right? The orbital mind control laser. It's a satellite in space and you can type in someone's name and it zaps them and then you can just control them. Is that ethical? I'm pretty, not, I, like I said, I'm not the ethicist, but I'm pretty sure an orbital mind control laser. One guy back there was like, oh. <laughs> Pretty sure using an orbital mind control laser, whether it's ethical or moral to do it or not, it makes me feel pretty uncomfortable, right? Stop I would, pushing your microphone. I would not. I'm pointing at myself. <laughs> I would not feel comfortable in a world where this thing existed, where somebody was using it, right? So, the thing is, mind control in some ways is real. Now, this is a picture of the Milgram experiment. It's famous. It's the one where they, you know, they told people to shock the people who couldn't repeat the word, right? Now, it had problems, right? But the point of it is that. Under certain situations, commanding someone or ordering someone to do something from a position of authority could get them to obey against their own will, right? Not all the time, but at least some of the time you could get someone to do something they didn't want to do. Now, even if you don't, you know, you want to pick on the flaws of the Milgram experiment, right? There have been other cases where this has happened as well. Uh, like if you might know about the guy who prank called like fast food restaurants and pretended to be the police and told the people in the fast food restaurants to do things that were not kosher and they did them just because a police officer on the telephone was telling them to? They put ham on the sandwich. <laughs> no, it was worse than that, right? But the point is there is some amount of mind control that is real that you can do to human beings. Really, really real. Now, this is a Skinner box, right? Uh, is anyone here familiar with the concept of a Skinner box? Okay, almost okay, everybody okay. cool, right? So the basic idea is you have a light and you have a lever and you have a reward for the, the animal and there's also an electric grate on the well, bottom. Well, the, the real core basic the idea, you can create an environment where you control all the stimuli. So you're creating a sort of sphere of senses and reactions, inputs and outputs, and you can basically cause behavior like the things in Skinner boxes are robots to a degree. All right, so uh, the point is that games are mind control. Right? What is a game but sort of a Skinner box, right? You are entering this environment of a game, especially with like an immersive video game more so, right? Where all of the rules and conditions and environment and sensory input within the context of the game are controlled and designed by a person, right? And those rules are going to govern your behavior, right? You know, when a game has a, a particular rule in it that says, yeah, uh, you lose health whenever you push that button, guess what? You're not pushing that button, and now your behavior is being controlled in some way. It's not absolute orbital mind control laser, like, ah, ha, ha, you played my game, now you're robbing banks and mailing me the money. Uh, That's but, a good idea for a game. But, you know, Fine. DR, like we said, right? It's controlling your legs. These arrows going by on the screen are controlling your legs. If you put a DDR in front of me right now, It'll just I start could, happening. I could consciously prevent myself, so it's not absolute mind control, but it's like I'd have the urge to just move my legs the way those arrows are going. It's sort of this built-in, almost kind of mind control, right? And if we're uncomfortable about orbital mind control lasers being real, 
Are we uncomfortable about this sort of half mind control that games are that is really existing, you know, and not some crazy satellite? Uh, so mechanism design, right? So we like to talk about game theory all the time in all the panels, right? But mechanism design is this crazy thing, and the reason there's a picture for Nobel Prize is because the guys who came up with mechanism design won the Nobel Prize for mechanism design. And this is part of what I deal with in my sort of real world outside of the games world job where I work on Wall Street. Right. And mechanism design is the idea that if you design a game, you have an interest in the way people play the game and the outcomes of the game. For example, on Wall Street, setting regulations in place to set the rules of the game, but you want the game to have a certain outcome, which ideally is economic prosperity or making all the money for me because I'm corrupt. Right, so it's sort of working backwards, right? Instead of asking the question, at least the most game developers I think ask, is how, we can, how can we make a game that will sell a bunch of copies? You're, you're asking, we want these people to perform this behavior. What game rules, what game mechanics, what game can we make to make those people do this thing? Now, mechanism design is a very mathematical discipline, and it's really not useful to analyze games the way we think about them. But from a psychological perspective, you can think of it more as, if I'm making a game and I want players to do these certain things, what about all this talk of gamification lately, about having games that push people in certain directions to save energy or be ecological or take care of their pets or whatever it might be? It's sort of like baby's first mechanism design. It's lacking only the rigor and the study to see how effective it actually is. Yeah, it's like in our forums on our, you know, for our podcast, we correct everyone's spelling in the forum, right? And it's like, you know, that is a mechanism. And what is the result of that mechanism? We no have, trolls. No trolls. They just can't deal right? with it. We have modified the behavior, right? Those rules that you we're gonna correct all the spelling, and now everyone behaves and double checks their posts to make sure they spelled everything properly. And anyone who knows how to spell, doesn't know how to spell properly, is gonna leave the forum pretty quick, right? You're doing God's work. All right. <laughs> um, so you know, we create a mechanism to get someone to do something. Now, is this stuff real? Oh yeah, it's real. Right? This stuff has been around for a long time, right? Now, are casinos ethical? I don't know. They exist. I've been to them. I've spent money at them. I've won money at them, All right? Uh, however you feel about them is up to you, but the point is there is no argument. A casino is designed, it is a mechanism that is designed in such a way to make you, any human being on average, go into it and give money to it and risk money uh, for the possibility of winning money. Uh, now, there is one good thing about a casino. And that is when you go into a casino, if you obey and you give it money, sometimes you can win money. You might actually win money's back, right? Somebody wins a slot machine jackpot once in a while, right? It happens. Someone wins the mega bajillion lottery, it happens, right? What if there was a, you know, a slot machine where you put money in and the percent chance of winning that slot machine was zero. No money ever came out of that slot machine, right? And that's a free-to-play game. <laughs> you go in and it's free to play. You can spin the slots all you want, but the odds of winning are very low. And winning means you win a JPEG, which is nothing, right? Now, you can spend money in that slot machine. And when you spin it, your odds of winning better JPEGs are greatly increased. Big JPEGs, flashy JPEGs, more JPEGs, right? But uh, the thing is, no money ever comes out. You're putting money in and nothing, imagine if you went to a casino and it was all these nickel slots and it was like, what do you win in these nickel? They didn't have trays for money to come out because you won nothing. All you got to see was, it's five cents, see some lemons spin around, that's your prize. <laughs> yeah, if you put in 10 cents, you're gonna see more lemons and less cherries. Now maybe we could argue that in a casino, people aren't enjoying the actual playing of the game because there's not much game there. They're enjoying the anticipation of actually getting reward. They're trying to get money out. That's the reason they're there. Yeah. But with these games, I mean, theoretically, you know that money's not going to come out of your computer. I hope so. so. <laughs> they could refund you on your credit card. That's a thing you can do. So nominally, you're playing these games because they are intrinsically fun. So is the reward I'm getting the fun? It could be. I mean, it sounds like, you know, the way my tone of voice is probably inferring that I think this is a bad thing. But actually, I don't know. Right? Is, this, is it okay if somebody wants to pay to see cherries instead of lemons or whatever? That, are they, they should be allowed to do that, right? They just really, it sucks. That's cool. Oh. <laughs> right? What's wrong with that? So in Japan... This is the impetus for us doing this panel. Who knows, this, about, who knows about the Japanese Kampugacha law? Okay. This oh, is a huge this deal. This is a huge deal. Japan apparently thinks that it is wrong and bad and they've made it illegal, basically. Um, so what Kampugacha is, to explain this, 
is, you know, you think of a gotcha machine in uh, Japan, right? Is you put a quarter in, you spin it, a ball comes out with a toy, right? So what you want to do with a kampu gotcha, it's kampu, like kampuri, it's complete, the complete gotcha. You have to get the full set, right? So let's say you got to catch all the Pokemans, right? So you put a quarter in, and a random Pokemon comes out. It's Pikachu, yes! All right, let's put another quarter in. Uh, coral Sola, yeah, really cute coral, yes! And it's coughing, man, coughing sucks. Uh, you put another one, another Pikachu. What's up with that? I want a spirit tomb. So I'm really trying to get spirit tomb and I'm pumping in the quarters. So eventually you got six Geodudes because I can't lose. Six Geodudes can't lose, right? But the point of Kampu Gacha is when you get the complete set, when you've got at least one of all 150 Pokemon, then the grand prize appears. You can cash in your complete set and you'll get Mewtwo or friggin' Victini or whatever the magical super uber guy is, right? And the only way to get that is to, right? So you're not actually putting in 150 quarters to do this. You're putting in bajillions of quarters because how many doubles are you getting? You're getting doubles and triples and quintuples and, right? And a lot of people in Japan were using this, and what was happening is there was outrage because some kid would get their parents' cell phone with some free-to-play game on it and spend thousands and thousands or millions of yen, just keep spinning the gacha, trying to get the complete set, and, you know, the people got upset, and they made it illegal now, to have complicated... Now, back up and think about that for a minute. A nation banned a specific game mechanic... Think about the ramifications of that from a free speech perspective, from an ethics perspective, from a sociological manipulation perspective. A game that can't be like if in the US we had a law that was like, you know what? You can't have head clicking games anymore. No platformers. Yeah. Platformers, illegal. So if you're still having trouble understanding the Kampu Gacha, I'm sure you're familiar with McDonald's Monopoly. Right? That is Kampu Gacha, right? You buy some fries, you tear it off, you get some properties randomly, you're trying to get a full set. And of course, the boardwalk is crazy rare, and everyone's got park place, right? <laughs> they just put millions of park places out there, right? So you keep buying freaking fries and getting real fat trying to get boardwalk. Uh, and you can't have McDonald's Monopoly in Japan. You would, the company would get fined, and they would make them stop, and there'd be all sorts of punishments and disgrace, and who knows what. So is Kampu Gacha okay? Think about that, long and hard. So, this is a, a chart that you're going to see a lot, or you may have seen a lot, and it's, it schedules reinforcement, and it goes back to, you know, the old Skinner box, right? And basically, the idea is, let's say we have the Skinner box, and every time the light goes on and the rat pulls the lever, he gets a food, right? Every single time. Well, what does the rat do? He sort of pulls the lever every time the light turns on until he's sort of full. And he's like, well, I'm, I'm done eating. And he, he, you know, he knows when the food's coming out. He Look at that red out. line there. If I vary it to where it's kind of non-deterministic, food doesn't always come out. It's not guaranteed. Yeah. He'll hit that lever all the time. Right. Sometimes he pulls the lever, food comes out. Sometimes it doesn't come out. What happens? The rat pulls the lever like a fucking maniac. <laughs> right? So that's, that goes with the Kampu Gacha, right? Is, is you pull the lever, you, you, you spin, you put a quarter in the machine and a ball comes out. You spin the slot machine and sometimes you get the reward and sometimes you don't. You're pulling the lever like a, like a you know, it's some animal instinct exists somewhere in, in mammals or even all, who knows? Now there's two sides here. Is this ethical if it's free? It's just, a, you know, I just put this lever out there and leave people to starve to this standing but, in front of but it? But if you pull, but if you put money in, you're doubling the chance that the food will come out. It's like, so it's their money, they can spend it sure, in free speech. absolutely, right? But the point is, is that everyone knows about, if you know about this psychological mechanism and you use it, are you doing a thing that is okay? Well, this is a question I've asked before of game developers and the answers are all over the place. I want you to really think about this because the whole point of this panel, since we're running out of time, this last bit, is that no one is talking about this, but we're all thinking it a little bit. So answer this question. If I design a game, I hire a psychologist, and I design it to take advantage of this and to take advantage of that brain to actively make people addictive. Scientists say this game will be addictive. Is that any ethically different from if me and Scott just make a game and we want to make the game until it's fun? And it so happens that we keep we make the game until we play it all the time. It's super fun. We addicted ourselves. If we analogously made the same game mechanic, the psychologist did evilly to do evil, but we did it just in the course of a game design, is there any difference ethically? 
Yeah, it's, you know, all the time we think about ethical, we're forcing players in games to make ethical decisions, especially in our tabletop RPGs. You want to force the players to make moral and ethical decisions within the context of the game. Oh, man. You know, or, like, think about, like, you know, all those nights of the old Republic fallouts. Should I be the good guy? Should I be the bad guy? Should I steal from the right? But no one really thinks about when you're a game designer, a game developer, are there ethical and moral decisions you make when you're designing the game? And I don't think the vast majority of game designers are thinking, you know, they might think about ethics in terms of like, oh, no embezzling in the company. Yeah, well, that's basic business stuff, right? That's not ethics of game design. Just no one's asking these questions. I want to start asking them. Uh, that's pretty much that. So is it OK to use these things for good, all right? Uh, we, I mean, I learned a lot. Does the end questions. justify the means? Oh no! Classic question, right? We don't really need to talk about it too much, especially with like zero minutes left. But you get the idea, right? If I use this kampu gacha and I get it to, you know, increase literacy in the world, is that okay? Maybe. Uh, what if, like the tabletop RPGs, I use mind control to get players to be better role players, right? A lot of tabletop RPGs do this. They will construct the dice. It's like, you know, it might be a better, you know, you, you have a better chance of winning if you make this decision in the game, but that making that decision in the game also is a more exciting role-playing situation, right? And indie RPGs, most of them, uh, the good ones, construct themselves in this way. They mind control you into role-playing better. They will have the dice or the mechanism of the game match the pacing of a good story so that even though you're bad at writing, you're having good pacing somehow. It's just magical. Is that okay to do that? You're still mind controlling people even though the end result is making people act better. Uh, and lastly, <laughs> right? Uh, I put developers so I can use the slide, but designers also, right? If you're making games, this is what you need to think about. Ask all these questions of yourself while you're making games. You think about it. Um, do I feel good about making this game that I have made? And ask it of developers of games you play. Hey, this game you made, do you think that decision you made as a designer to put in this mechanic is that ethical? Now you all happen to be at PAX where a lot of game designers are here talking about their games. Uh, go pester them. <laughs> and tell us what they say. Don't tell them we said this. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, that's all we got. Thank you I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> 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 <laughs>